It's good to have your company as we come together to study God's Word. Our studies continue in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 21. We've had one little introduction to the final scene, scene 8, and we have a second introduction today before we go on to look at each of the seven final revelations in this final scene. And it is a picture of the glory of heaven. So we will take a little bit of time to consider and to rejoice in what God is revealing to us. Let's come in prayer. Father, we bless you that uh, your word is truth. As Jesus has revealed to us, on that last occasion with his disciples, uh, declared the veracity of your word to them. Lord, we pray that you will help us to understand your word more fully, but more than that, Lord, to allow that word to penetrate deep into the soul, that we might marvel and be glad at what you have chosen to show to us and that we can rest content and sure in Christ. Lord, hear our prayer for Jesus' sake. Amen. We read the first nine verses of Revelation chapter 21. We will focus a little bit in uh, the final part of this study on the verses themselves and just see how um, beautifully John has this vision of the the fullness of Christ, his, his uniqueness, his power, his authority, and his love for his church. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God and he will be my son. But the cardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magical arts, the idolaters and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come. I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Friends, we uh, come to our second look at the introduction to this scene. thought it was important that we do that because here in verse 9 there are two persons in inverted commas. One is an angel and the other is the bride. The angel is one of the bowl angels, and the bowl angels were involved in the delivering of the the last uh, judgments of God. Um, And with that over, 
then there is the glory of the kingdom fully revealed. So we looked at the angel and why it was one of the, the bold angels bringing um, this introduction and showing John the bride. And so we come to look secondly at the bride, the second person in this verse. Before we'll look in time, I trust, to the seven final revelations in this last scene. And then just a little look at the epilogue, the last couple of verses in this whole book. We think of the bride. The angel announces the bride, uh, telling us of those who are so blessed of God, their sins are washed away, their names are written in the Lamb's book of life, they have an eternity in the glory to appreciate and enjoy and to honour their God to the full. Right back in scene one, we were introduced to the concept of the bride. And this forms the background to the letter to the church at Thyatira in chapter 2, verse 20. Now, Jesus accuses um, Jezebel, a false prophetess, of misleading the servants into sexual immorality. Now, whether Jezebel is an actual person or uh, a, a picture of uh, the wicked king's wicked wife, Ahab and Jezebel, um, back in the book of First Kings, um, not exactly sure, but Jezebel, sometimes we hear of people being called a Jezebel today, someone particularly wicked and vile and immoral. But the charge is that uh, God's people are led into sexual immorality. Now, what's the background here? Sexual immorality is a sin uh, in its various forms is condemned throughout the scriptures of the Old and the New Testament. But here in this pictorial book, it is a metaphor, it is a symbol of um, spiritual adultery against God. It's spiritual sin. In the Old Testament, uh, the book which reveals so much to us of Israel's history. Israel is accused of adultery when she serves idols. Why? Well, because she is in a marriage relationship with God. That's how God, in part, defines his relationship with his people. He calls them into that bond which he defines as a type of a marriage. And if you go back into Isaiah chapter 54 at verse 5, you find Isaiah declaring God's word saying, your maker, God, is your husband. And therefore all sin can be defined as an unfaithfulness to God. And so the concept of the marriage bond so sexual immorality covers this as a metaphor of all sin against God. Now that doesn't lessen what sexual immorality is. But here it's, that's not the only thing. It's all sin is encompassed in that picture. Because it's being uh, faithless. Not being faithful to God. Uh, in this marriage that God has defined. In the New Testament era, Christians are wedded to Jesus. The Lord's bride in the Old Testament is Israel, and the Lord's bride in the New Testament is the church. Now, of course, there are not two brides. There's the one bride, but God draws his people from all generations out of the Old Testament 
and out of the new. And through the following generations to the present day. Now, of course, Old Testament Israel, those who belonged to Israel, and also New Testament, those who belong to the church. It's not every Israelite or every church member is part of this bride this bride that belongs to Christ. Because in the Old Testament, there were faithless Israelites, as in the New Testament and the generations that follows, there are those who claim to be Christians, but aren't. They don't have a saving faith. They don't have hearts given over to Christ. They have the name, but not the nature. And so the bride of Christ is his faithful in Old and New Testament times. And I suppose we define that most simply by those who have experience of God's grace. And that revealed in two fundamentals. There's a repentance of sin a turning from sin, an acknowledgement of sin and personal failure before God, and the acknowledgement that a person can do nothing to change their status, a personal confession of sin, and also a personal faith in Christ and Christ alone as the one who by his life and death and resurrection has the power to deal with the sinner's sin, to make that person clean. And also to give that person the righteousness, the rightness that they need before God, which um, was so clearly shown in his life on earth. We talk about sin being removed and righteousness imputed. Righteousness, as it was, is poured into the person to make them perfect before God. And so this bride is the faithful uh, in all generations looking to Christ either in the Old Testament looking forward in faith trusting that God would act as those after Christ look back rejoicing in how he has acted and here in Revelation uh, we also have this picture of the church as the mother which we looked Uh, when we were going through chapter 12, verses 1 to 6, and how that represented the people of God of all ages. And so we're reminded again in Revelation, there are different pictures that convey the same truth. This mother speaking of God's people of all ages. Here we have the picture of the bride and As we have been looking through this book, we we have come to understand that two different pictures can mean the same thing or two different pictures can speak of the one happening. And so we don't have to see a mother as something different from a bride. It's the the context uh, of what is being revealed is important and we've seen this this wonderful unity um, and in a sense a unity in simplicity going through revelation and it's perhaps a bit like like a a spine in a human skeleton if you have just the uh, the spine right then what goes off the spine you're not carried away with irrelevancies or, or, or confusing lines of thought or, 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 or attempts to conform something to a certain interpretation. Just keep the, the pure spine and let it uh, be that overwhelming picture and message that we receive. And we'll come to look a little bit at that in 
uh, our study today. The church is seen by Jesus in the letters that are given in the very first scene. These letters read to the, the churches and they give a picture of how the church really is. And that's the one of the key ideas of seven in the book of Revelation. Seven speaks of reality, of how a thing really is. So the pictures of the seven churches, they were seven literal churches, but um, each of them giving an aspect of just how Jesus sees the church today. In scene one, the church is described. Um, and we've been taken on in our studies in Revelation through all the scenes. And what's overriding in each of these scenes is the authority and the power of God. We have there pictured the salvation that has come through Jesus Christ. We have depicted there the battle um, in the ages against the church and the world by the devil. We have pictured the ultimate victory of God and the final judgment. And now at the end of this book, we have a window that lets us look into heaven. And that's scene eight. And as we come to scene eight, it's not surprising the journey that God has led us through in considering this book of Revelation. Through the scenes of the book, we've been taken from viewing, as it were, our day-to-day -day affairs in the life of the church set in the midst of this world. We've been taken from that to see beyond what is apparent and visible to the events in the unseen world and to see something of the warfare of the Lord Jesus Christ against the devil. We have seen Jesus in his power and glory and that revealed in increasing splendor as the book unfolds. He is in perfect control. And he is the subject, not us. In just reading through the scenes of Revelation, John marvels time and time again at the power of the Lamb about his glorious suffering, about his wondrous victory, about his reign from the glory. It's all about him. He is the subject. And with that in mind, the introduction to scene eight becomes all the more remarkable. Because heaven is God's dwelling place. And yet, preparation is made for frail human sinners washed in the blood of Christ to dwell with him. And more than that, to be prized by him. Not only to be loved perfectly, but to experience that love in all its perfection for all eternity. We have passed beyond the realms of time and space into the realm of eternal light where there is no sin and no imperfection. We read that in verse 4. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. See, I am making everything new. And all attention is on Jesus in verses 5, 6 and 7. And yet, 
he is not alone. Sharing the scene with him, in fact, taking its title role, is a radiant stranger. A new Jerusalem. We read of that in verses 9 as we finished our reading today and into verse 10. The bride of the Lamb. God's people. And here pictured is every true believer. Each person saved by the power of God by his grace, that experience through a repentance from sin and a personal trust in Christ alone, a knowledge of the Spirit giving us help that we might live and comfort that we might be strengthened on this journey through life until we meet our Lord in the glory. It's a picture of every believer. And that's, again, one of the resounding beauties of the gospel. It's not for clever people or special people. It's not for one culture or one group favored over another. God comes in Mercy that no one deserves. And each of his children are equally loved. Our job, in a sense, is to understand that love as fully as we can. And so to experience that love as fully as we can. And exhibit that love as fully as we can. Here we have a picture of every believer. And that believer makes up the bride of the Lamb. Here in the last scene of the Bible, uh, God's people are seen as married to Jesus. Paul has already given us a, a, a wonderful picture by the Spirit in Ephesians chapter 5 at verse 26 and verse 27. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. A picture of perfection. We, unlovely in our present state, should marvel at how much Jesus loves us. Because on that day, he will have made us to be perfect. And our perfection, most of all, is to declare his worth. What sort of a bride is worthy of Jesus? Only a bride that is perfect in every aspect. And unlovely as we are as sinners, he will make us perfect in every part of our being. That as perfectly redeemed souls, welded together as the bride of Christ, we are that perfect companion for him. On that day, he will raise us to a place of honor in the wedding feast of heaven. And he will make us worthy to be his bride. 
before we come to look at these final seven revelations we've had this um, look at the introduction to the scene the angel showing us the bride and we see something of the of the perfection that is awaiting us as these final revelations are revealed let's just look briefly at the verses we read today in verse 1 we have this picture of Jesus in power making everything new I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven had passed away and there was no longer any sea we know from the Old Testament that the sea speaks of turmoil and, and trouble. The sea is a picture of confusion and oppression and danger. But all that is taken away. There is no more sea. Everything is clear. And there's this picture of a new heaven and a new earth that encompassing all things, seen and unseen, everything will be made new. So this, the, the, the beginning and introduction of this scene begins to say everything is perfected. Now, let's see how and why. The second verse, I saw the holy city of the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. So this holy city, this new Jerusalem, is the bride. The bride is the people. So we are reminded that this city isn't a literal city. It is a picture of the bride it's a picture of God's people and again this book uses symbols and pictures to take us into much deeper realities you stop at a city you miss the whole point of this chapter the city speaks of the people and when we come to see how it's made its dimensions, we'll see how God is defining his people, but that's to come as we progress through this last scene. Verse 1, Jesus makes everything new. Verse 2, his bride is perfectly suited to dwell in eternity with him. Verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will usher in an eternal age where God will be with his people forever. Now, we see glory upon glory being built as each verse unfolds. Jesus makes everything new. And he makes his bride perfect. And he says, God will dwell with his people forever. This is an eternal thing. Verse 4. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. No more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. No more curse. Sin has no place. Sin has no power. Everything will be perfect. Everything's made new. A bride for Jesus. An eternal age where God dwells with his people. 
The curse is removed and everything is perfect. And verse 5. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. There is one word that is true. And that is the word of God. And all other words have falsity in each makeup. The best of human words have falsities. And of course, some messages are particularly and deliberately deceptive. And of course, Satan is the accuser. He is the deceiver. But here, as we have this window looking into the glory. There is no sin. And the word of God is seen to be perfect and righteous and pure. The last word is the word that Jesus speaks. And he silences everything else that is false. Verse 6. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He is all in all. And this drinking from the spring of the water of life speaks of that eternal life that is our possession. He is its author. He is its sustainer. Our life is in him. And the eternal son of God can never fail. Our life in him is sure and certain. Verse 7. He who overcomes will inherit all this. I will be his God and he will be my son. The position of the righteous. Part of the family of God. What a glorious thing, not just to be a subject of God, but to be a son or a daughter of the Father, to be a brother or sister of Christ, to be dearly loved, a member of God's family. Verse 8, but the cardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. The first death is physical. The second death is eternal. The first resurrection is spiritual. The second resurrection is that of a physical change in body that allows us to dwell eternally. The second death is being far from God. And that's the end of those unconverted, those whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life, the position of those outside Christ. And that too will be to his honour. Then we come to verse 9, the verse of our study. The angel and the bride. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, 
I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And so we are ready to see as this first revelation is just about to unfold from verse 10. How Jesus sees his people. We would not see ourselves at all like this. But this is how he sees us. And we begin that study, God willing, next time. The first revelation. God's city. Verses 10 to 21. Let us pray. Our Father, we bless you for such grace that encourages us in these words. We thank you that though Christ, your eternal Son, is all in all, he delights in his new Jerusalem his bride, those he has loved, those he died for, those he makes righteous, those he makes perfect, that they will be that companion he desires in all fullness. Lord, we pray that you will help us to see just how dearly we are loved and how precious we are to him. And let us have expectant hearts as we begin to look at these final seven revelations. Hear our prayer. Accept our praise. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Please join with us next time if you can. And we look at the first of these seven final revelations.